the six step process the body uses to detoxify and eliminate mycotoxins. So first of all, we have to make a little distinction between mold and mycotoxins, because these are very different things. And if you're new to this game, you might not know the distinction or the difference. And the, the difference here is really important because mold is, mold is not really even, I would say it's not even half as bad as mycotoxins. It's way bigger. Your body can process and eliminate it a lot easier. It's, it's, it's about 10 times bigger. So a, a mold spore is about 10, 10 to 100 times bigger than a mycotoxin. And this is why mycotoxins are quite, quite sinister and can be quite dangerous because they are so, so, so tiny and they're not even alive. So even the treatments that you would look at for uh, killing and remediation. So however you, however you go about that, the mycotoxins, they're not even alive. So you, you can't even kill them. These are fragments of what, fragments or molecules of essentially a poison toxicity that's produced by a mold to uh, protect them in their environment. And they do that by making you feel, feel really bad. So these things are potent antibiotics. They have a, a very antibiotic nature. This is going to be a very important point that we're going to cover in the fourth, fourth and fifth step of this six step process, because it's got a, a double feedback loop that makes it really hard to recover from. And we're actually going to go be going through these steps in reverse, because I want to, I want you to think of this process. I'm going to use the analogy of a river. So the, the closer the river gets to the ocean, the wider the mouth gets. And this is important because there's more flowing closer to the ocean than, than further, further up the stream. And the same is going to be true in this detoxification process. We need to make sure that the water is able to flow. So the detoxification process is able to happen further down the stream so that we don't create a flood. And in this case, a flood would look like a Herxheimer reaction, a detox reaction. And th this is a key indicator that what you're doing isn't, you're not doing it necessarily the right way. You're not going about it in the most optimal way. So some of my opinions around this are somewhat controversial. I'm not a big fan of binders personally. I don't think that any like healing or detox reactions are they're good indicators. Healing is supposed to be soft and gentle. And when you're having these reactions, from my perspective, it means you're either missing something or you're pushing too hard or you're doing it in the wrong order. So I'm going to work this process backwards as where you need to start, what we're going to be covering first, and then taking the steps back to the root, which is going to be the mycotoxins that you have already accumulated and have stored in, inside the body. So six step process, I'm gonna walk you through the, the process now. So this is from top to bottom, and then we're gonna go through them bottom to top as, as, to, as to what they are and how we fix them. So from top to bottom, we've got this, the, so the toxin is stored inside the cell. We need to get it out of the cell and move it into the blood. And then when it's in the blood, we need to move it out of the blood into the liver. Once we've once it's in the liver, we need to take it from the liver and put it in the bile. Once we get it into the bile, we need to move it from the bile. So this would be inside the liver. This is stored then in the in the gallbladder, comes out into the digestive system. We need to get it deconjugated, detached from the bile and stored in the microbiome. And then the microbiome will hold that and it basically turns into poop. And then we need to get that poop out of your body. And if you're able to go through this six step process, the mycotoxin that was inside the cell, that was the root of different types of hormonal endocrine disruption. So these, these mycotoxins are very estrogenic in, in their nature. So they can cause estrogen based problems. This is the root of the, so these are antibiotics. So this can cause uh, deficiencies in flora. This can cause autoimmune disease, especially for when the immune system is attacking certain tissues that are that are more that have more fat in them so this is a really good example would be like myelin so something like multiple sclerosis the mycotoxins they they dissolve in fat and that's a that's an intrinsic part of this process because this this process is how we remove all fat soluble toxins so although we're really specifically focused on mycotoxins today you can actually apply everything you learn here for every single fat soluble toxin. So this includes all of the fat soluble metals. So this is like mercury. This includes other types of xenoestrogenic compound, compounds. So this is like plastics, things like that. This includes glyphosate. This includes loads and loads and loads of different types of toxicity. And they all use these six steps. And this is why it's so important that we understand this process because not only does this help us to recover from 
mold and biotoxin illness and, and mycotoxin exposure, but also other, all of the other types of fat soluble toxins that we're exposed to in our environment. So that's from pesticides like glyphosate to chemicals from cars on, on the road. Like even right now, if you're wearing clothes that have some, some polyester or some other type of plastic based material, in, you're absorbing some plastics from that just by wearing them on your skin and you need to detoxify them. And this is how your body does it. So we're going to go through this process in reverse and we're going to talk about why this step is important and, and, and how we can support it. So, so first step, so, so technically this is a step six, but it's the one we're going to cover first. So step six is your poop and getting it out of your body. So the most important thing that we cover here is, is, is the, the topic of constipation. Being constipation is quite literally the antithesis of your poop coming out of your body. So we have to try to figure out why is the poop not coming out of the body? This is one reason I'm really not a big fan of binders because a lot of binders make people constipated. So yeah, you might be helping your body further upstream on step step four or five, but if you're making step six stop working so effectively, you're actually creating a backlog of problems. So this is, this is really not helping. So the most important thing that we can do here is to make sure that you're going regularly. And the, the, the shortcut to this is to use an enema. So an enema is a, a process where you're administering water, you could use a coffee enema. We're gonna talk about that more on step four. You could use some type of enema. If you have to use laxatives at this stage, it's, it, the, the, so the thing with, with using laxatives or things that help you go to the toilet is they're not good to use long-term and they shouldn't be your long-term game plan. You shouldn't say, okay, I'm constipated, but I can take a laxative and that fixes the constipation temporarily and I'm just gonna do that for the rest of my life. That, in, in my opinion, is not how these kinds of things are supposed to be used. The way that we want to use medications is to help you manage the symptoms in the short term so that you can focus on resolving the root cause of the problem, and then you don't need to depend on the medication or the supplement or whatever it is that makes you go to the bathroom. So if you're using these short term, it's still not ideal, but you have to go to the toilet. It's really important. And I can tell you, I was, I was constipated past a week, 10 days if I didn't take anything or if I didn't use anything. And I was doing lots of other things to try to encourage natural bowel movements, which we're going to also discuss. But if you need to use something, then you need to use something. Staying constipated is only going to create a negative feedback loop for this whole problem. This is, this is the final stage where the toxicity is leaving the body. And if this is not happening regularly, you're going to just be reabsorbing everything. So some really important factors to consider when we're looking at constipation would be microflora and microflora balance electrolytes and soluble fiber content these three things so soluble fiber content goes hand in hand with electrolytes with uh water balance in your body so hydration but they, they, they all really tie together and there's a really there's a really obvious and, and great solution for for this so constipation is an indicator that something is not quite right in the gut and it's usually either electrolytes or or microbiome it's usually one or the other so when the microbiome is deficient, so when we don't have enough of the right species of microflora, you're just not going to be able to go to the toilet because your, your poop is literally living in dead bacteria. Of a healthy person, 80% of their stool is living in dead bacteria. It's not actually the food that you're eating. It's not actually the indigestible substances like the fibers. Most of these fibers have been broken down into short chain fatty acids that you've then reabsorbed. Your stool about 80% of, of, of dry mass is living and dead bacteria. So if you don't have enough bacteria, it's going to make sense that you, you're not going to be able to go to the toilet. Key indicator that this is, this is the problem for you is your stools are really hard and they're also very small, no matter how much food you eat. So you can eat large quantities of food, even indigestible matter like fiber, that probably just makes things worse. It probably just makes drier, harder stools. So one of the most important things we can do here is use some type of probiotic supplementation or fermented foods if you, if you tolerate those. So using a probiotic is super important. And we're going to talk about this more in the next step because the next step is all about the microbiome. So for now, I'm just going to cover the hydration element of this. So your body requires electrolytes to function. These are, um, these are minerals like magnesium and potassium, and they have an osmo osmotic effect. So wherever they are, they draw moisture towards them. If you don't have enough electrolytes in your body, your body is going to absorb all of the electrolytes from the food you, that you eat out of your gut into your body because it needs them. But then you have none left in the gut, which means all of the water also gets absorbed and that creates a, a, 
a dry, hard stool. So we need to make sure that we have an appropriate electrolyte balance in the body first, and then almost without trying, we're going to improve the electrolyte balance in the gut. Because as the electrolyte balance in the body is more healthy, the body's going to need to absorb less from the gut, which is going to allow more of these electrolytes to stay in the gut, which is going to allow more fluids to stay in the gut, which is going to make the stool not so hard. It's going to make it not so dry, and it's going to make it bulkier and easier, easier to pass. So my go-to for this is to do juicing, is to try juicing. And I would suggest low-carb vegetable juicing to start. So you can juice whatever works for you. For me, for like four years, I just juiced kale juice because that's the only vegetable that I didn't have an intolerance to. Many of my clients do well with courgette if they have lots of intolerances. One that I would say if you don't, if intolerances aren't a problem, optimal juice, I would go with some celery, some kind of dark leafy green like kale. You could use cabbage or lettuce, a little bit of lemon and a little bit of ginger. And you want to try to drink more and more and more of this until you begin to notice that your stool is normalizing and you'll hit you'll hit a point where you go the other way you should be drinking the juice and your stools will become start to become liquid this is a good indicator that there's enough soluble fiber there's a, there's enough electrolytes that there's enough fluid what in in what you're now consuming that you've gone the other way so you just dial it back a little bit hold it there and your stool will will, will be really good it will, it will normalize itself and this may change. You may find that as you stay with this for a little while, your body is like, wow, we have electrolytes now. We have all of this really good stuff in our gut that we've been missing. So it starts to increase the uptake, which means the constipation comes back. So what does that mean you need to do? It means you need to increase the juice intake again. So this is something that you're going to modify back and forth based on the symptom expression. So this is only one half of it. Second half is the microbiome, the, the probiotics, which we're going to talk about now. So this is step number five. So Step number five is microbiome to poop. So as we, as I, as I just touched on, your, your poop is mostly living and dead bacteria. And if you don't have the right bacteria present, you're not going to be able to have a bowel movement because your bowel movement is mostly, mostly these bacteria. What's really important is, so we're going to touch on this again in the point above somewhat, is these organisms are really important because not only do they create the bulk of your stool, which is which is significant because it's going to help with this constipation, this potential constipation problem. But on top of that, one of the jobs that they have is to decouple, so they, they can deconjugate, they can, they can do lots of different processes. But in essence, they are finding a, so let me, let me use a little analogy. So I've got this really cool little, little thing here. So imagine this is a bile acid and you have toxins inside your bile acid. And this is how your body detoxifies. So it's holding it like this. If you don't have the right microflora, your body squirts this out when you eat fat. And then your bacteria are supposed to come along and take this out of your bile acid, which you then reabsorb and you can use again. And we reabsorb most of our bile, actually about 90%. So we use the same bio, bio molecule nine times before it's excreted. So if this process isn't happening where your healthy microflora comes over to this bile acid and takes the mycotoxin out. If this isn't happening, this mycotoxin gets reabsorbed nine times. So even if you have a low level of toxicity, if your body isn't, doesn't have this, it doesn't have this mechanism able to help it pull the toxin out of the body, it's going to keep looping. And it, the, but when this is happening, this bile acid cannot be used in detoxification because it's already full of toxicity. And every time it comes back into the body, it's being exposed to this toxicity again. So what's really important in this stage is we have the right microbiome to decouple this, this toxicity from, from the bile acid. If this doesn't happen, you're, you're going to get stuck at this point. This is where I see most people get stuck. And this is where binders come into play for some. Because when we're using a binder, we're trying to replace this process. But the thing is, binders are not alive. They're, they're, they're in inert dead substance, like activated charcoal or um, a clay, for example. They, they, they can, they, it's possible for them to pull the, the toxin out. They can, they can pull the toxin from the bile acid, but no way near as effectively as having a healthy microflora. I'm sure you've probably had this question. Especially if you've lived, if you've been, if you've developed a, a, a really horrible illness like chronic fatigue syndrome, or you've become really, really ill, but you have other people living in your house 
that maybe they have a couple of symptoms, but they're nowhere near as bad as you. And it makes you ask the question, like, why? Why do I, why, why do I feel so bad when this other person doesn't? And yeah, genetics can play into it some, but that's not the biggest factor. It's this. It, this is the biggest factor. If you don't have the right healthy microflora to enable this decoupling process to occur, you're basically exposed nine times for every molecule that they're exposed. They get exposed and they remove it from the body, but you don't, and you're exposed to it nine more times. So you're nine times more toxic. Your symptoms are nine times more intense. So the adaptive response that happens when you don't have the ability to do this is your body develops something like SIBO, small intestinal bacterial overgrowth. You can also see higher levels of organisms like, um, I actually found out recently, organisms like H. pylori, but even before that, things like uh, bilophilia and other types of hydrogen sulfide producing organisms. This is happening as an adaptive response because these organisms, they produce hydrogen sulfide, so they're providing some level of, they're supporting the sulfation pathway, which is part of how we detoxify these things up in a step further inside the liver. We're going to talk about that in just a minute. But they're also helping in this process of pulling the toxicity out of the bile acid. So what the, the mainstream or the, the, the modern treatment for SIBO right now is you have an overgrowth, let's kill it. But we need to look one step further and say, okay, we're having this organism overgrow. And instead of just going after that, always ask the question, why is this the most unfathomably intelligent response for my body to do this? And you have to ask that question and then you then you will come to to answers like this this is the only way i was able to build these six steps is every time something was going wrong in my body and have a new symptom i i would ask the question how is this the most unfathomably intelligent response to help me adapt or survive to my highest level of health in the environment that i'm currently in if you can if you can nail that if you can get that fixated in your head as a mantra and keep asking this about all of your symptoms you will actually find real solutions to your symptoms, regardless of what they are. But in this case, this is why SIBO is an adaptive response. And this is why when you then try to kill the SIBO or you try to do a low fat diet to starve the bilophilia, you feel worse and you're going to feel worse because you've just stopped your body's adaptive response that's trying to keep you healthy. So you don't want to do that. You don't want to fight your body because you're going to lose and you're going to lose hard and your quality of life is going to be awful. So don't fight yourself. Don't fight your body. Your body's smart. Work with it. That's where the solutions are. And that's what these six steps are designed to do because we're working with the body's innate process. This is These six steps are why the people that live in the same house as you don't get sick because they have these steps working. So if we can support these steps in you, you'll be healthier too. So making sure that we've replenished the right microbiome is really important for this, this step. This really can be, and in my experience, is as simple as a high strength lactobacillus and bifidobacterium blend. You don't need to get complicated with this. These are the species of organisms that are present in every single healthy person's gut. The probiotics that I like to use, that I, that I use, I use, I use, I use a variety of different probiotics. When I'm starting with a, with a new client in a situation like this, almost without exception, we will be using the custom probiotics brand. If they have histamine problems, D-lactate problems, or they're way more sensitive they have lots of sensitivities we will start with the d-lactate free formula this is a six five or six strain blend of lactobacillus and bifidobacterium that do not contain histamine and contain contain histamine degrading strains so they're going to actually help you with your histamine tolerance and for people that are a little bit further along or they don't have so many intolerances we will use the 11 strain formula so this way we can get some, some increased diversity which is going to help with all of these processes of optimizing the stool improving the bowel function it's just gonna it's just gonna help so this is where i would usually start and i find these are usually a pretty safe option for almost everyone without exception not medical advice don't quote me on that but i in my experience i found these are really safe and they're really effective as well these are what i used myself to pull myself out of this and i've used them with hundreds of other people before and they really work they're really effective so moving on to the next step so on to step three we need to encourage the liver to release the bile. That's, that's, that, that's the, this next step. This whole process of the bile deconjugation and the, the toxin removal and decoupling process that occurs in the gut cannot happen if the bile is not entering the gut on a regular basis. And the only way that you can effectively 
consistently stimulate bile release is to eat a high fat diet. There is just no other way to do it. You can do things like including some bitter foods in your diet. So as I said, I did kale juice. That's a really bitter vegetable. That's going to stimulate bile production somewhat. You can do things like coffee enemas. They are going to be especially helpful if you have uh, methylation problems, if you have um, gallstones, and if you do struggle with, with liver function. So I, when I was living in Malden, in my, in, in my worst place, I had severe liver pain. My liver felt enlarged in my chest. And I could feel it. And doing a coffee enema would give me almost immediate, very rapid relief. And that tells you it, it's helping. And the reason it helps is it encourages your body to package up all of the toxicity that's, that's flowing through the liver into the bile and release it into the digestive system. So you can see why this is so important that we work from the bottom and build our way up. Because if you do this process, say you do a coffee enema, for example, you release all of this toxicity into the gut but then you don't have probiotics there waiting to help you in this de decoupling process, you are going to reabsorb them and you're going to feel awful. Binders can help somewhat with this if you're missing the right for aura, but let's work with the body and do and support the body to start functioning the way that it's supposed to again. So use a probiotic. Probiotics, when they're dead, they even act as binders. So you, you literally cover every base. Probiotic is so much better than a, than a binder in my experience. And then you also have binders like like cholestyramine, for example. I'm really not a fan of cholestyramine because if you're in a place like this, your liver is already struggling. Your liver is already struggling just to function. And when you use a cholestyramine binder, so remember we had this analogy over here. If you have this bile acid and it's holding this mycotoxin, well, what cholestyramine does is it binds to the whole thing. It takes the whole bile acid and removes it. Sorry, got a bit excited. Removes this all from your body. So you lose that bile acid, but you would usually be recycling nine more times and there's a good reason that we do this recycling process nine more times it's really expensive to make this is one of the most metabolically intensive substances that your body produces and when you strip this out of your body you're making your already exhausted liver work nine times harder because it would use this nine more times and you just ripped it out so i don't like it for that reason it, it's going against that body it's stealing its resources which is going to make you feel bad so how do we stimulate this process more? We can just incorporate more fat into the diet. So your best options for healthy types of fat, I, I'm, I'm a big fan of saturated fat. I know that might go against what maybe what some of you have, have learned. I've got a video coming up very shortly. I actually have it on my whiteboard just over there. I'm going to do it soon. It's all about cholesterol. So stay tuned for that one. It's going to, going to answer all those questions for you. Cholesterol is really good. Saturated fat is really good. Saturated fat, any type of fat is going to stimulate this bile release. Saturated fat is your more preferable option. Cholesterol helps so much when you're exposed to mycotoxins. My cholesterol levels were five times higher than the safe limit. And the higher they went, the better I felt when I was being exposed. So mycotoxins have a, a very inflammatory and very destructive effect in the body. And the body produces cholesterol to protect itself. So if we can support that, this is, again, this is something that's happening in the liver. If we can support that process by providing cholesterol and providing saturated fat. You're only going to feel better for it. And since not being exposed and, and doing this six step process, my cholesterol is now only just slightly above normal. And I'm still not hundred percent yet. I still have the odd thing here and there that I need to work on. And I didn't take any medication. I still eat. If you, I didn't, we, I think right now I'm eating about one stick of, of grass fed butter every single day. Which is, which is a lot, it's a lot of fat. So the only way that you can stimulate this process, this bile release is to eat fat in the diet. There's just not really any other option. So you need to get your fat intake up. Fat is such an important backbone of every single cell in your body. You use it to make all steroid and stress hormones. Your body is 50% by dry mass. Your body is literally like 50% protein, 50% fat. So you need to have a good amount of fat in your diet. It's really, really important. And it stimulates this process. So moving up to point two. So actually, let me just give you a little, a little note here. So all these steps so far. So this is step three, four, uh, step three, four, five, and six. So these are the bottom four steps. These are the four steps that you, I would not go further than this. I would not go up to step one and two if you are not out of the moldy environment. You, let me just let me just say, you're just, you're just not going to heal in the moldy environment. It just doesn't happen. You're, it's so hard for your body to 
do to do this process it's it's just not going to feel safe to go back into what you've already stored and start working on it unless you're not being exposed to new toxicity anymore these steps so three four five and six these are the steps that your body is looping through if you're still exposed so you're breathing them in you're swallowing them they're coming into your body and they're going into the liver and then this process is occurring so you really need to support if you're still being exposed and you support these four steps step three four five and six it's going to make you feel a lot better in the environment that you're in but it's not going you're not really going to be working on any of the mycotoxicity that you have stored that you've accumulated in your in your body in your tissues and i wouldn't encourage you to move on to step one and two until you're out of that environment because you're going to be tapping into potentially a lot of toxicity that your body has stored your body's really smart and it knows when it doesn't have enough resources to process the toxicity that it's being exposed to it will store them in this case mycotoxins it'll store them in body fat and it will hold them until another time when you are able to to process them so moving on to step two step two is we need to move them from the blood into the liver so this will be happening to some extent if you are if you're breathing them in, like if you breathe them in, they're coming into the blood and then you, they need to be filled out. If you're breathing, if you're, if you're swallowing them, like if they're, so with what you breathe in, a lot of it will be caught in your mucosa, even the mucosa in your lungs, you'll cough it up or you'll breathe it up and then you'll swallow it and it will go into your digestive system. When this happens, it's just going straight to that liver step. If you're breathing them in or if you get some on your eyes, for example, that's going in, that's going into your blood. And th this is going to be that this step. The best way that you can improve this step of moving the mycotoxins from the blood to actually go into the liver and be filled out by the liver is anything that gets your heart rate up. So this could be exercise. And I know not everybody can exercise right now. This could be um, heat exposure. And I know some people are heat intolerant. And this is probably why you're heat intolerant, because this is pushing this step too far. There's almost anything you do that's going to increase your heart rate is going to support you with this step. It's going to help your body move the toxicity that it has in circulation into the liver. So anything that gets your heart rate up is going to do that. Two biggest things, exercise and, and heat therapies. And heat therapies is a nice segue into point number one. So the last step here, or the first step, depending on how you look at it, this is getting cellular toxicity to be released from the cell. So Heat therapies are also a really good option for this. So this is why people are big on like saunas and hot baths. I really love hot baths with Epsom salts, a really great option. Anything that makes your body uh, hot, like really hot, like sweat, sweating hot, is going to be encouraging this, this detoxification process. It's not so much that you are sweating the toxins out. You are, but that's maybe like five, five or 10% of what's happening. What's really happening is you're releasing this toxicity and then it's coming to the liver. The liver is filtering it out and then processing it through these other, these other steps. So it's not really the sweat. Is it, when you're sweating, it's not really the sweat that's pulling the mycotoxins out. It's just stimulating them to come out of the cell. And then these other steps are what's picking it up and pulling them out of the body. So this is why it's kind of scary for me when I hear people saying like, oh yeah, I'm just gonna, the first thing I'm going to do is I'm going to jump in the sauna. And I'm just panicking over here thinking, and what about your liver? And what about your bile? And what about your microbiome? And are you constipated? Like you have to do these things first. Otherwise you're going to jump in the sauna and you're going to feel awful. You're going to have a panic attack. You're going to have a crash because you've pushed your body. You created a flood further up this stream and that's going to make you feel really bad. So you have to start from the bottom and work your way up. Some other things we can do at step one that can be really helpful. One of these is fasting. So fasting is really cool because not only is your body going to go into repair mode and fix all of the damage that's been done by these mycotoxins. So I'll tell you a bit about chronic fatigue syndrome. One of the, one of the reasons that you get such severe poor post-exercise recovery, if you've been exposed to mycotoxins, is as these are fat soluble in nature, they, they like fat soluble, they like fatty tissues to, to go in. Your mitochondria has a bilipid membrane. So you've got like, you've got like a mitochondria is like this, and it has another layer of fat on the other side of it. So it's got two layers of fat, which means mycotoxins love to go in there because it's just loads and loads of fat. And on the outside of a mitochondria, you've got these five little pylons where they're like, oh, I see you want to do exercise or you want to think something. You need some energy. Okay, let's make some energy. So 
a molecule of your food comes on, gets attached here, and then the mitochondria needs to pass this through all of these, these, these pillars, comes over to here, and then it's released as an energy molecule. And then you have thought and you have um, energy or ability to move, you have performance. But what happens is when the mycotoxins get stored in the mitochondrial membrane, one of these pillars gets damaged. So this mitochondria is like, oh, I'm really happy. I will make you some energy. A little food molecule comes along. It gets passed between the pillars. It comes to this one. It tries to pass it onto here, but it doesn't exist. And it pings off. And what, this, what happens when this pings off is, first of all, you don't get an energy molecule. So you, you don't get energy. But what's worse is you now create a, re a reactive oxygen species. So this is an inflammatory molecule. This is just as bad as a mycotoxin. And you just create it in your own body. So when we fast... All of these mitochondria that are damaged, the body says, you're broken, we need to fix you. So it'll dissolve it and build a new one that's going to be healthy. So this can break that cycle. But in that process of breaking this, this down, the mycotoxin is released. And then it, it can then get moved into the blood and then in the blood into the liver and then out through the digestive system as, as stool. So fasting is a really, a really great option for this. I think it's actually the best option. If you just do the fasting, you don't need to worry about the, the, the heat therapy. I'm also going to talk a bit about bioresonance. You don't need to do that. You can just do the fasting. That's that's the best thing, in my opinion. But you have to make sure that all of these other steps are supported. You have to make sure you have a good microbiome present. You have to make sure your bile is flowing. You have to make sure that you are going to the toilet. Otherwise, when you fast, you're just going to release lots of toxicity that's going to stress your body out. So the final option for this, this first or final step is bioresonance. So bioresonance is a type of I suppose it's stuff of energy medicine that can encourage the body to release the toxicity that it's stored. I do some, I do regular bioresonance uh, programs for groups of people. So if you're interested in that, mycotoxins is one of the things that's included. And it's not necessary. If you can do fasting, it's better, but not everybody can do it. It can be quite harsh, can be quite aggressive. Not everybody's in the right place for that. But you have to make sure you're doing this in, in this order. You have to make sure you're starting at the bottom and working your way up. So now I'm going to go through from bottom to top and give you a couple of strategies. So I'm going to go, go over these and look at these from a, a lifestyle perspective, the things you can do to support this process. And I'm going to kind of bullet point them just to make sure that you have these also. If you have been taking notes, great. If you haven't, start writing things down now. This is going to be really important. So getting your poop out of your body. We can support this through juicing. Digestive enzymes, they can be really helpful for this as well. Juice, juicing is a big one because you're covering electrolytes, covering enzymes, covering soluble fiber, you're getting good quality water. Just do juicing. You're providing binders. You're doing juicing is so good. It's such a, it's one of the things that I almost just default to with almost anyone if there's a level of tolerance with vegetables because it just so universally helpful. It improves the strength of the microbiome, it encourages bioflow, it just it does everything. So if you can juice and you're not, you're crazy. You should be doing it. It's such an easy thing to do. And it's so well tolerated and it's so universally beneficial. There's not a single step in the six step process that juicing doesn't benefit. So juicing, just, just do it. It's so easy. It's kind of annoying to do, but it's such an easy thing to, to, to get all of these things working. So um, for, for step six and for step five, you want to make sure that we have a, a good microbiome. So a really easy way to do this is to use a a blend of bifidobacterium and lactobacillus strains doesn't have to be super complicated, but you do, you may want a higher dose. Mycotoxins are very antibiotic in nature. They have probably destroyed your microbiome diversity and quantities. They've destroyed the population. So you need to make sure you're replacing them. So for some people, this is, I would say at a minimum, you're going to be looking at 100 to 150 billion CFUs. On the upper end, I've worked with people up to like a trillion, even a trillion and a half CFUs. So th that's like, an astronomically large amount, but sometimes that's what you need because if you're missing them, putting them back can make a big difference. So using a high strength probiotic can be really helpful there. Improving the health of the bile. First of all, making sure that your bile is being stimulated regularly is really important. So making sure that you're eating a high fat diet is really the best way to do this. You can look at making sure that you're providing the ingredients for new bile. So some of the most important things there being saturated fat, so you can make cholesterol. Lots of cholesterol goes into bile, so it's really important. Juicing covers so many bases. There's lots of um, B vitamins and like this, this whole process of bile creation and putting toxic, putting toxins into bile, does things is involved in the methylation, transsulfuration, like a lot of these different pathways play a role at this step. So 
supporting the liver to function. You could do this with juicing again is really good. Probiotics really helpful because you're going to stop this, this cycle of toxicity reoccurring. Your body really knows how to heal itself. You just have to figure out where it's stuck and provide it with the support. And if it's being exposed to the same toxin nine times because the microbiome isn't present, put the microbiome back is the best way that you can help the liver to function. It doesn't even necessarily need all of the supplements and the like the milk thistle and all that. And maybe that would be helpful. And I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying instead of just doing what would be convenient and what sounds easy, do the things that are really going to make the difference. Do the things that even if you only focus on doing one or two things, and I would say these one or two things would be juicing and fix your microbiome. That's going to be the most important thing you can do to help your liver. Something that really helped me was coffee enemas. Some people do really well with that as well. Um, we can look at your sulfur levels. So including more sulfur in your diet can be really helpful. If you're sulfur intolerant, that's a huge indicator that you need more sulfur support. One option that you might try for this, if you're sulfur intolerant or not, would be Epsom salts because we're providing magnesium sulfate. So we're not shoving sulfur in at the top, which can cause a lot of the intolerance problems. We're supporting the process at the bottom. So we're just providing the sulfate molecule all the way at the end of the transsulfuration process, which just supports this pathway, which means the sulfur that is leaking through can go into the other things like glutathione production and all of the other important jobs that sulfur does in your body. It's actually the sixth most abundant mineral in your body, super important, used in so many different things. One other form of sulfur that is generally very well tolerated is MSM, methyl sulfonylmethane. So you can maybe try that as well. Um, encouraging the, the liver to, to move this toxicity into the bile. Again, coffee enemas, pretty good one for that. Just making sure that you are supporting liver function. So if you know you have methylation problems, make sure that you're taking the right B vitamins. You can eat liver. That's a really good option. I know it sounds kind of stupid. Like, oh, this organ's struggling. Let's just eat it. It kind of works. You know, simple is, simple is kind of smart in many ways. So if, if you have liver problems, eating liver as a supplement or as a glandular can be really helpful. Moving the blood into the liver is really just a matter of get your heart rate up. So anything that makes your heart beat faster is going to help you with that step. And to encourage the body to release the toxins from the cells, we would just be looking at fasting is your best option. It's, it's, it's amazing. Different types of thermotherapy can help. So hot baths with Epsom salts especially can be really helpful. And using a sauna can also be a really good one. And uh, if you need some extra help with that, bioresonance can also be a really good option but i think fasting is the best one i know it's kind of annoying to do it's kind of hard you have to not eat and it's not for everybody if you're in a really depleted state might not be might not be right for you where you're at but fasting is definitely the first the first the first and best thing for, for that step so that covers the six steps that the body uses to eliminate process and detoxify mycotoxins 